Thank you, Chris. Uh, I want to thank you first and foremost uh, for the platform. Uh, thanks to Brand Innovators and Influential for allowing me to be here. Now, I wanted to, um, you know, uh, thank you all for being here, but I also wanted to just give a little uh, introduction to myself and why I'm here today. Um, Hispanic male, um, grew up in, in the inner cities of New York and worked my way into media and uh, very, very happily landed in, in the radio uh, format. You know, I, I wound up going into traditional radio uh, probably in the mid 90s and thought it was gonna be sort of like a fun, easy walk, but realized soon that it was gonna be a challenge and uh, more of a, of a battle. And I saw myself as a pioneer in radio as we scraped for 60 cents to every dollar that the general market would get versus what I was getting at urban and Latino stations. So um, I learned early on that, you know, there's ways to go as far as diversity goes and uh, equity. And for me, it's just such a uh, near and dear spot because I felt that early on, I, I, I was sort of a pioneer, uh, which was exciting. And um, uh, it was gratifying to see all the changes that have come since that time. And for me being along with the three of you who are phenomenal pioneers in your own right and in what you do every day, uh, it gives me great pleasure to ask you guys a few questions and have some dialogue and hopefully we can uh, pass along some great knowledge to all the folks that are tuned in right now and, and spending their afternoon with us. Um, so with that, I wanted to start with a group discussion. I wanted to open the floor. So we're talking about media, right? Do you believe that today's brands are doing a good job at fostering equity in their messages, right? And what does that look like to you? Who would like to take that one? I'll start. I can kick it off, Rick. Um, so I, I think that's a, I think it's a, a tricky question. And why I say tricky is because my, my personal mantra is that diversity is a journey, right? So it depends on the brand and it depends on a company. Um, it depends on where, where you are internally um, with your DEI practices, beliefs, um, leadership. And so you are seeing some brands that are out in the marketplace that are kind of eons, if you will, above others. And then you see others that are just starting out. So you're going to continue, in my opinion, to see this span of activation, understanding, um, like I said, activation, marketing, campaigns, products. You're going to see a, a wide range of that as we are quote unquote, getting up to speed, if you will, um, or if you're along there, you see brands and companies along that, that diversity and inclusion journey and continuum. Got it. So you're thinking it's more of an evolution? Most certainly. Oh, most certainly. <laughs> most certainly. Got it. Got it. Jay, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I totally agree with Mimi. I, I do believe that we're starting to see a turn of the corner where there's better representation across, you know, all mediums. But we're still not in a space where it is completely uh, inclusive or, or equitable. But I think you know the events that happened last year started a conversation, and we've seen minimal efforts to like make this turn. But we are actually seeing more and more people who look like ourselves, you know, represented in media. And I think it's starting to become at the forefront of what we do and what we care about in terms of these companies. And because of you know, the, the events that have gone on over the last couple of years, this last year especially, I, I believe that, you know, we'll just see a, a continuum of this. And so I'm happy with some of the results that we've seen, but there's still a very long road to go. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Uh, Raquel, what do you think, Rocky? Yeah, Jay, we definitely have a long road to go, but what I am seeing and that really excites me are more brands taking what I would consider to be risk and what they definitely probably consider to be risky, which is investing in products, investing in campaigns or cultural celebrations that they haven't embraced in the past, probably because they didn't think that there was a market there or that it wasn't um, you know, economically viable. I'm seeing more diverse representation of the AEPI community, which is humongous, but has been treated um, really monolithically for years and years. 
And I'm really excited about the opportunities. I think brands are going to start to unlock the fact that we're going to be seeing more data coming out of those campaigns, success stories, which is just going to encourage people to continue the journey on the continuum that Mimi mentioned. <laughs> that's that's great. And, and I think one thing that stuck out that uh, a lot of you sort of uh, either mentioned or alluded is that there's a ongoing conversation. And I, I think the fact right. that we're there, that's a good starting point, right? Like we're, we're sort of at, at the cusp of like getting things finally uh, to happen. And I think that that's only gonna happen through these kind of conversations and being open, right, to the information. So if you're on the receiving end today and you're listening to these two brilliant people talk, you wanna take some notes and, and really like take it to heart that th this is coming from people who uh, have not only uh, been pioneering it, but they're living it. Um, so I, I think that that's a very powerful message on its own. Uh, so Rick, Rock, I'm sorry, yeah, Rick, one more. I and I'll just add to is that you, we make a great point of starting point. I think the rubber will meet the road is to see if this has longevity if it's evergreen, right? It, if, if it's being done because of what happened last year, is it a short term or is it a long term? I think that's what we're gonna be in to buckle up our seat belts to see. Um, and that's where we're really gonna see true change is in the long term. So like you said, great start, a lot of great strides, um, but are we, are we gonna see that continuum happen um, over the years? Exactly, no, that, that's great. That's great. And, and I, I believe wholeheartedly as well, um, I think we're, we're in a good place where you have companies like, you know, Crayola, Kindred, or, you know, Robinhood that are all, you know, starting to take that initiative and building from within out, right? Because that's where it's got to start at the core of, of the organization. So uh, all valid points. Thank you, guys. Uh, Rocky, since uh, you, you made some really strong points about, um, about DEIA, uh, tell me a little bit about the work that you're doing supporting organizations uh, that are starting to become a little more introspective. You know, they're, they're considering their impact on the envi on environmental, social, and governance pra practices. Uh, what's driving this reassessment? Uh, wh what do you think is at stake for companies not convinced they need to make those decisions? Great question, Rick. And the last discussion with Jay and Jessica touched a lot on this, the social movements, the stakeholder demands that are driving um, leaders to really take a step back in an assessment of these are things that maybe weren't on my business priority list that need to be amplified. And also realizing, doing that assessment internal to the organization, what resources do we have to accomplish this work? What do I as a leader, what tools and skills do I have to do this work? And I think people are seeing that there, there's a gap there. And so the work that I do day in and day out is really to help support those leaders who need more resources, tools, and understanding in order to respond to those stakeholder demands. It really caught my eye when Jay was talking about in five years, he's expecting a turnover in leadership. I think that's absolutely true. We're already seeing that happen where leaders aren't just haven't been able to kind of make that jump, especially in the difficult circumstances that we're in right now. And so when I think about what's at stake, I honestly think a little bit more about the individual and what's at stake for them. Um, if they're not able to find some personal connectivity to these issues and understand how they influence their decisions, how they can shape the vision of their organization in a way that's gonna continue to contribute to its growth and success over time. Um, I don't think any of us like to think about being left behind um, by, by, by the moment, by culture and by our workplaces. And so that's really what's at stake. Like it's, it's, it's really the need to upskill and invest in those spaces, um, not just putting a campaign out, but truly having that internal transformation, that team and workplace transformation to support good work in the market. When I said organizations are taking risks, we're seeing some swings and some misses. I think it speaks a lot to what they have internally to support those risks. Um, so that's really what came to mind in that question. And what do you think breeds that, you know, that, that shift, you know, what, what's happening? Yeah, I mean, it's a few things. It's the generational shift where we're seeing Gen Z into the workplace. It's the socio-political conditions where we're seeing um, a lot more division in our um, political state. It's the, the urgency that's brought by the public health crisis, um, by the environmental crisis that we're facing. And then of course, there's the underpinning to many of these crises, which is the continued support of, um, frankly, racist policy and systems across our entire society. 
Um, and so that's why we're talking about DEI and A at the center of all of these major issues that we have to grapple with as leaders, um, you know, navigating our livelihood, our safety, everything. Um, so definitely that's driving those shifts. <laughs> totally. I, I agree with you. Um, that that definitely makes a lot of sense. I see sort of a different mindset entering the workforce, right? It's like a different um, expectation. And, and I think that it's, it's, it's the, the leaders that embrace that uh, are the ones that will be successful. And as you said, you know, won't get left behind, right? Because no one wants to get left behind. So you work with a lot of leadership development. Um, what, what does it mean to be responsible, responsible leader in, in today's workplace? That's a great question, Rick. I think it's um, it's a complicated question. Like Mimi earlier was saying, it really depends on your organization, your brand. I think that there are a couple of hallmarks though, and, and one of them is um, a commitment to analyzing the structure and processes that, that put your workplace together um, and analyzing those things for inequities and for accessibility and for how it's um, potentially influencing your outputs. And then there's also the internal work, like I mentioned before, the personal connectivity with the issues, um, really taking the opportunity to explore how your, what your position is um, in the, the organization. And so responsible leadership means you can't skimp on the internal work and that you actually have to wield your power. I think a lot of leaders um, can be a bit hesitant to wield their powers or to push um, an organization to make steps on environmental, social and governance issues, DEI, DEI in particular. Um, and I think really, if you're not willing to wield your power, the other like hallmark of a responsible leader is someone who's willing to yield their power. So it's kind of like either do something about it or at least step aside and create a path for those who are in a place and ready to make those changes. <laughs> I love that. That's actually really powerful. Um, you know, so if you're a leader out there, take heed um, because uh, Rocky, you work with lots of organizations in, in developing them from the inside out, as we mentioned earlier. Um, what, what has driven you into this? Like, what is the, the impetus for you? Great question. I'm, I'm really passionate about changing our workplaces. I think a lot of us start our careers full of ideas, full of energy, full of our education and, and the wanting to contribute. And the path that we take through the workplace does not necessarily allow us to leverage all of that enthusiasm and passion education to be successful. I found immediately in my career that I was faced with sexism, racism, I was faced with pay inequity, and then that doesn't even count for the societal issues that impact me just because of my identity. I'm a queer woman as well. So I'm you know, fighting for marriage equality. I'm a black woman. And so my family has been impacted by generational wealth and equality and, and what that means for the roles and, and career that I can build. And I really started to figure out ways to assimilate in order to succeed. Like I think a lot of us do, we code switch, we figure out how to build um, power, we figure out how to get promoted. But then at the end of the day, you're still in a workplace that doesn't structurally support you, right? And so I, I got very passionate about like, how do we transform workplaces to not create trauma in people and to not um, build hurdles for people who could honestly be doing and giving so much more um, and could honestly, uh, you know, be contributing to success in a really different way. And so that's really how I got into leadership development. That's how I started thinking about how do we show people how all of these issues intersect and how do we support people who want to do the inner work um, to transform not just the leadership that they're um, demonstrating, but also the workplaces and the structures that they operate in. That's wow. It's, that's amazing. Um, and obviously that's gonna continue to fuel your, your passion and keep you going. Cause that's, uh, you know, we, we all live, eat and breathe it in, in one way, shape or form, um, whether it's, it's gender, whether it's, it's lifestyle, uh, it, it, it will all eventually um, affect us. And, and if you are running a company, clearly you have to have the mindset to say, you know, I have a thousand employees, 10,000 employees, you know, they're all coming from all walks of life. How do I, how do I keep them happy? How do I foster their and celebrate their uh, individuality and what makes them who they are? So clearly, um, that's that's I think a, a driving force in uh, a lot of the panelists today here, myself, and 
actually, I want to switch over to Mimi because this kind of brings me to you because you had something to do with something really cool that uh, I, I actually love because I'm, I'm a, a father of three Latino kids, uh, two girls, uh, one boy. And for me, um, I've always noticed that, you know, some of the products that we use aren't always geared towards us. And there was always that concept of like um, invitation versus permission, right? So it's like, right? So there's like permission is like, okay, try this general product that is like good for anybody, right? Like uh, whatever product it is, I don't want to name any companies, but uh in, in, in versus an invitation where you're literally saying, hey, I made this product with you in mind too. Right. Uh, so, so with that, Mimi, I'd love to find out a little more uh, about what you've been up to recently and the innovation that's come out of Crayola. Sure. So what we're talking about, and thanks, um, Rick, for that. What we're talking about is Crayola's um, Colors of the World Skin Tone Crayons um, that launched back in uh, 2020. And how that started, um, and I have to tell the story of, of the impetus because that's very important of how it happened, um, is we had an opportunity, Crayola is known for color. Um, so we are founded on the principles of color chemistry and color innovation, um, and we do that every year. Um, so we were in the throes of innovation and we took a pause to look around the marketplace and we noticed that the world is becoming more diverse. There was a study that we looked at that said over looking at 27 countries, over 70% of those residents felt like their world was becoming more diverse. So this is happening on a world standpoint. Number two, you look at across the marketplace. Um, we're seeing brands like Fenty. Um, Rihanna had just launched her Fenty line back in 2017. So we're seeing brands and products um, becoming more inclusive, um, if you will. And then we just took a look at internal. Crayola launched multicultural crayons back in 1992, and that consisted of eight colors. And those colors were like mahogany or burnt sienna. Um, and while there was fanfare for that, for those products, we also did hear from consumers that, hey, number one, it's not enough. There were eight colors. We need more. Two, we need better names for those colors, more representative of skin tones. Um, three, we need new colors, like the colors that we had were already existing in other packs. So they weren't necessarily skin tone colors. Um, but they were put together um, for the best representation at that time. And then last but not least, we definitely could come up with a better name uh, for multicultural. Multicultural is not crayons, but it's, it's not a thing. So we definitely could take that opportunity. So um, I had an idea of the way that which we go to market. So a lot of what you say, Rocky, is that personal passion. And so went to the organization and say, hey, I had an idea, not only on um, from a marketing standpoint, because that's the role that I'm in, um, in marketing, but I have an idea of how we should um, even develop this product and bring it to the marketplace. And um, inside of a week, I had um, a meeting with leadership and that was across HR and marketing and um, creative and manufacturing and R&D and you name it. So we had all the right players in the room. And the idea was a two-pronged approach. One is we bring someone in who lives and breathes skin tones 24 seven. So we know color, but we don't necessarily know skin tones. And so just kind of recognizing what you have in your real, in your wheelhouse, right? So that was number one. Um, and then number two was at the same time, we need to walk the talk. So while we're developing, have a product development process, we need to be take this opportunity to look at our internal processes and optimize them. Um, and that was that was the simple recommendation. I brought in, you know, I brought in um recommendations and strategy as to why looking at the marketplace. I didn't assume that our leadership kind of knew the lay of the land and what was happening. And what I mean by that, there were missteps. Again, I'm not going to name brands, but there were some missteps that had happened. Um, and in this world of social media, a simple misstep can become, you know, a, a nightmare PR as well as um, product, if you will, and revenue for a company. And inside of an hour, I got um, alignment to move forward with the strategy that I put forth. Um, and I brought in um, Victor Casal. Victor Casal is has 30 years of experience in skin tones. He first started with developing foundations for burn victims. And then he was the R&D director for MAC um, Cosmetics. So one, he already had the empathy. Two, he has the science and formulas. And three, he also was the CEO 
um, and co-founder for Cover FX, another um, foundation company. And I looked at beauty first and foremost, just because when I looked at the industry, who was the, who to me was the, being the most inclusive, if you will, or having the most strides in inclusivity. And for me at that time, it was beauty. So inside of a week and a half, we had Victor Casal in our offices, and that was innovative in itself because we've never opened up our R&D processes, so our formulas. So we had him opening up his formulas, us opening up our formulas to put together um, to come up with 24 brand new colors. And I can tell you that those colors were not because we have 24 count crayons out in the marketplace. Um, we started with his 40 color global palette. So this was all about, to your point, Rick, about inclusion and making sure that we are talking to everyone, right? That invitation um, to everyone, um, as well as those marginalized communities as well. And so we stepped down those four, that 40 color palette um, from, um, from light to dark, but also as well as from, and using undertones, which is definitely um, in beauty. So golden, rose and almond. And that's how we came up with our 24 new colors. We also leveraged the best practices from a naming the crayons. So we have colorful names like Macaroni and Cheese and Purple Mountains Majesty and Robin's Egg Blue. But that doesn't help consumers when you're trying, especially kids when you're trying to find a skin tone. So you'll see colors and colors of the world, um, color names that look like medium deep almond or extra light rose. And so right there, you can start to get an idea of your skin tone color. We also put um, those color swatches on the pack so kids could actually use the packaging to help find their skin tone colors. And it really was about, when we think all the way back to the beginning of that project, it really was about inclusion, first and foremost. I know we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion, but for Crayola um, and for myself, it really was about inclusion first. And why inclusion is because inclusion is about feeling included. It's about feeling valued. It's about feeling in, you're, you're in a safe space. And in those safe spaces, you can thrive. So you have to create that, that atmosphere, if you will, in our environment of inclusion first and foremost. And then we also followed up with the principles of credibility, transparency, and authenticity. So no matter what we did, whether it was product development, research, marketing, PR, whatever it was, everything, partners, licensing partners, it all went through that lens um, of inclusion, um, transparency, credibility, um, and, and authenticity. So um, we, and we, and we launched during the pandemic, as you can imagine. So this was really a, a digital and social activation. Um, but again, it has been an overwhelming response to um, the crayons. And I can tell you just personally, just, um, and you talked this too, Rocky, too, just personally having, growing up and not having a crayon and not being able to pick one crayon to represent myself. So when I had the opportunity to draw myself or do a self-portrait, I was picking two or three colors and trying to blend them um, and not when looking at my finished product, I wasn't able to look down at that piece of paper and see an image that looked like me. And the goal and the impetus of Colors of the World is that now you're able to do that. You're able to say, nope, not only do I have one color, I, may, I have maybe like four or five, and then I can narrow it down to this one. And I can actually look down at my self-portrait and I can, I can actually represent and see myself accurately so that was, that was the external. The internal I brought in, I proposed bringing in Marjane Moore Roberts. She was uh, the current Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer um, at Golan at the time. Um, and she was a former Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Yahoo. And um, I gave her kind of what I thought from a Crayola standpoint, I uh, set up interviews with her and our leadership team, including our acting CEO at the time. And it was one-on-one -on -one interviews. And it was to understand where each of our leadership was personally from a DNI standpoint. Um, where they felt the company was at the time and where the company wanted to be. And so Marginet took that information and brought back and said, hey, based on all of the interviews and the mindsets, here's where I think Crayola is. The good thing is that we were already on a journey. And here were some recommendations that um, I have to kind of take you further um, to jumpstart and optimize what you're currently doing. Our SVP of HR, Ovro Trout, took those and Cray Crayola eyes them. Um, and from that, we been like off and running since then. And I can tell you, we've um, introduced two new ERGs. We have new metrics. Um, we have, I've brought on a, um, an agency to help us look at all of our content um, to get to for another inclusive lens, if you will, to make sure again, we're, we're sidestepping some of those mishaps. And again, back to my point, diversity and inclusion is a journey. So you're going to have some, you know, you're going to have some learning and growing pains. So we don't have it all the way to bright, but we are on a journey and that's what's most important. 
And, um, and in that too, we launched our first inclusion council of which I'm the vice chair of. So a lot of great work, I would say externally with Colors of the World and a lot of great work internally, um, but leveraging that product innovation with our key customer to help drive internal cultural change and, and mindset change. So it's been um, an awesome ride, <laughs> awesome ride. Rick is still going. So. No, it's amazing. And I got to tell you, thanks to you, I no longer think I'm mahogany. So uh, <laughs> you that. are not. Thank you are you, not. Thank you. Yeah, so I you, challenge yeah, you to find you. your color. <laughs> that affected my childhood greatly. So you're not you. mahogany. <laughs> um, so okay, so like you have the backing of the organization. So clearly, your your internal leadership is um, they, they're forward thinkers. They get it. They understand. They've sort of been stuck in this bubble for a long time. Time to innovate. Um, that conversation you said it was relatively easy, right? I would say. I would say yes. I think part of that is, I think there's this perfect storm. I've been asked that question a lot of like, how did you get it? I know that's that's the that's the impetus, right, for kind of change, if you will. And I think I'm going to say it needs to be a perfect storm, right? Your organization has to be ready for it um, from a leadership standpoint. I think the marketplace has to be begging for it. Or I'll put it this way. For us, that perfect storm was marketing. Um, the world was ready for it. We were already seeing it happening. There were already examples out in the world of those folks that were doing it well, as well as some of the mishaps that I had showcased of what happens when you don't do it well, or even, even, um, even you know, not meaning to do it. And I also gave them some examples. Hey, here's some examples of how Crayola could have done this, made some missteps, but because we have you know, some folks at the table, we, we ourselves kind of sidestep some things. So we want to make sure that we continue to do that and be inclusive and leverage the voices that we have at the table um, and, and hearing and, and moving forward and being smart, smart in that way. Um, leadership as well, being open to it as well. And then consumers definitely, our target audience, you know, needing and desiring it. One of the key um, points that we, that I, I referenced in my um, rationale um, was that Gen Z is the most diverse generation that we've ever seen. So I think roughly we looked at data of like 46% of Gen Z under the age of 20, I believe, um, identify as being a minority. And so again, if we are a company that is for kids, this is something that is a must have. It is not a nice to have. It is not a, we can do it next year. This is something that you know we should be doing right now today, um, if you will. So again, back to that um, that easy conversation, I think is just making sure that you have kind of all your, all your data points again, sometimes, and I'm going to be honest, sometimes leveraging the business opportunity sometimes is needed to help move our DNI within companies. I think we would like to, we would like to see where it's just a passion and it's the heart and we want diversity and inclusion and it is important. That's true. But sometimes you, you need that business opportunity, um, if you will, to kind of help move that along. Um, and that's definitely, this is definitely an example of, of, of how that helped jumpstart that. So it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but definitely when you have business behind it, that can help put dollars and cents behind it, definitely helps to move the needle and move those mindsets and culture chains a lot faster. Right. No, definitely. You know, I mean, it's, I guess, good and bad, right? Money does move things, I think, a little faster when, uh, when there's uh, some sort of uh, opportunity there. So I, I, I can understand well, that. Yeah, but we're we're, comp we're in companies that are making so we're in consumer product goods. So we're in the business right. of making right. products for profit. So it, it makes total sense sure that yeah. we're connecting right DNI to the business sense, right? That is business sense. It is it can make money. It will make money, um, and it is needed. So it was not just a nice to have. Right. It right. is a business case for diversity and inclusion. Just making sure that we're shared, we're showcasing that um, internally. I think sometimes that's that's left out of the equation, and it's more right. of a hey, Nice to have. We should be doing this. No, it makes good business sense to do it. <laughs> Period. <laughs> totally. Agreed. I, I mean, I could tell you a lot of people I know that are definitely buying the product. <laughs> so <laughs> that makes sense. So you did mention, you know, D and I, and and you mentioned uh, internal, um, you know, forces now, and and you're part of Crayola's first ever D and I council. Yeah. So you're leading the charge internally. Um, yeah. What are you learning from that? Like, what are your what are the employees <laughs> saying? Like, what's the internal scoop? A ton. I would tell you a ton. So first, I've never led a diversity council ever in my life. So be always ready when you when you ask or you make a recommendation. Be ready to lead it. Um, so um, I would say I've led ERGs. 
So first and foremost, it was for me understanding like what an inclusion council is, the, what's the purpose and goal of an inclusion council. Um, and then it was starting to craft it from the very beginning. So um, I've, I was able to find, or we were lucky to find um, like-minded employees who also felt, you know, diversity and inclusion to be passionate, something that they wanted to work on in addition to their day jobs. Um, and so we have a team of about 15 members, um, inclusive of leadership, um, which is about another four. So about 19 members. Um, we created a mission statement. We divided or the council up into committees that line up with our different, or with our five frameworks for DNI. Um, and I can tell you honestly, <laughs> this has been, I was just on the phone with the, with the group yesterday and the work that these committees have done inside of one year. So we have one committee who worked and looked at all of our, our employee handbooks and made recommendations and changes there. We had another committee, it was Business Impact, who we need to understand DNI US, but we also need to understand it globally. So looked at all the markets in which Crayola operates and had um, an understanding, get a better understanding of DNI there so that we can start to bring that in and understand as we're looking at our innovation for 2023 and beyond um, in marketing. We have another uh, group who started to celebrate um, our employees. So we have employee spotlights, but making sure we're bringing a diversity lens and celebrating the differences. Another group, um, looked at, rolled out our first ever um, corporate training, if you will. Um, not training, but I would say um, uh, it is a, um, an exercise for team building, if you will. That's what it is, for team building. So that's almost the whole company is almost trained on that team building. And it's all about kind of sharing and celebrating differences um, and, and driving trust. So literally, when we look at the work that's been done or, or for that amongst our five-point thrust for DNI with this group, it has been, I, it is invaluable one, um, but I would say it's, I'm speechless. Um, and again, this is just work from employees committed to this work of DNI. So sometimes it just takes one to kind of get it started and get it rolling. But once it does, definitely it is like we're 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 rolling down the hill now, um, and we're excited about a year two. But definitely, you know, energized and um, I would say consume our employees, our Crayolians, what we call it ourselves, are definitely learning. Um, and being to be more empathetic and just open to, hey, there's we're, we all live in one America, but it's different depending on who you are in America. Um, and just understanding that and realizing that when you roll up your sleeves day to day with your, with your team, with your team, um, your teammates and your leaders. Yeah, so sounds like awesome. there's no stopping you now. There's no stopping you. <laughs> <laughs> A ton of work there, but it's been Love great it. work. It's been great work and a lot of learning, just like awesome. you said. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And I wanted to shift to Jay since we're on the topic of uh, uh, DNI and and overseeing these these internal councils. Uh, so Jay, you're you're here with us from Robinhood. But before joining Robinhood, you were at Facebook and uh, you were part of their DNI council. You led it for a number of years. Um, how is that? You know, I mean, such a massive organization and such influencers in the world, right? Like socially impacting decisions and thoughts and ideas. So um, clearly having some internal guidelines or some playbooks so that, you know, it obviously permeates throughout the, the, the business into all the other aspects of what you do. Uh, how was that for, for you? Tell us about that. Yeah, uh, it was an incredible journey, but it really started with, you know, Facebook taking a chance on me. So I, I was a college dropout at the age of 19, looking for an internship. And, and I happened to get an internship through a uh, internship program uh, by the name of Year Up at Facebook. And by doing so, I was their first intern that they had taken from the, one of these type of programs. And at the time, the company was a much smaller place. There weren't as many uh, diverse employees. If I can recall at the time, I was probably one of like five black employees in our, you know, Menlo Park campus. And, uh, and I remember that because we would have these, you know, lunches and everything together. And so when I started, my entire goal was to just make the most out of that opportunity and succeed and get a job. Like that was the thing for me because I understood that this was like a place where I can grow, a place where I felt comfortable. Even though there weren't a lot of people who looked like me, I knew that if I were to secure a job here, I would put it on myself to make sure that we keep this door open. And so that's exactly what I did. 
Uh, at the end of my internship, I was offered a position. I gladly accepted. And the very first conversation I had was, how do we do this again? How do we get someone else who looks like me in here? Let's keep this door open. And, uh, you know, kind of what, what Mimi said, you have to, you know, be prepared for when these moments happen. And it's very true because they were like, well, if you want to do this, you lead it. And I said, sure, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'll figure it out because this is important to me. <laughs> and so uh, I, I rallied up a number of troops. We put together a plan of action. Uh, we worked with our recruiting team. We worked with a number of different teams and we brought in two interns um, from the same program. And from there, every six months we were doubling to the point where we had gotten to uh, 32 interns a cycle across a number of different fields uh, in, in departments in Facebook. And so I had one position and I was also leading this. And we got to a, a point where we had scaled and we said, okay, this isn't just a test bed. This is an actual talent pipeline. And we have to look at it as so. So we have to put the resources behind it. So from that moment on, we actually utilize a specific space where we can train talent we can help talent grow, and then we can you know, bring talent into Facebook. And we did that to the tune of about 60 to 80 interns per cycle. So completely transforming you know, lives, but also transforming the business of Facebook because we were ensuring that we were, had this diverse, this diverse pipeline. And the reason that that was so important to me was not just because I lived it and I had been through it, but it's this growth cycle that I like to call that we were ensuring these young adults were having. Um, I understood that my, my time at Facebook and my time in my career was only going to happen and, and only going to grow if I had the right people, the right tools uh, and the right mindset around me. And sometimes we see a lot of people who come into certain places and they don't have the support system, they fail and then they look at us like we can't get the job done. So creating a, a really, really intensive environment that is gonna be nurturing to us is incredibly important for, to retain talent as well. And that way, when talent does move on, which they should at some point, they are going to continue to do the same thing because they've sh we've shown them what that looks like. So, and I think in seven years, uh, we hosted over 500 interns with a 48% retention rate for, uh, for conversion as well as 16% you know, of those becoming uh, leadership or management level. And 80% uh, of those who did not stay with us either went back to school or retained other jobs um, in Silicon Valley. And so when I look at diversity, I kind of look at it at the start of it, the heart of it. How are you getting in the door? And then how are people helping you get out of that door or, or to the next door? And, uh, it's incredibly important that we have leaders at the top of this who are very, very passionate, but not just passionate, but understand the growth cycle. And, and that's something that like I, I will continue to push. And when I joined Rob, <clears throat> when I joined Robin Hood uh, just a few months ago, that was my very first conversation. Not necessarily about what I was here hired to do, but what are we going to do for people who look like me? How are we going to continue to support people who look like me? Because I would like to be here as well. And if you're not about that, then I don't know if it's for me. And, and that's something that I would take with me everywhere. Wow. Now that's, that's awesome. And clearly, you know, you're all very passionate people. And um, I would love to keep this conversation going, but I'm getting that like red blinking light that's saying we've got to wrap it up. Uh, I want to thank the three of you. Uh, you've all enlightened us and given us some incredible insights to take with us. Uh, I really do appreciate uh, everyone sharing their story. And um, I, I'm just at, at all, in all, and I'm, uh, you know, humbled by, you know, the three of you. So thank you so much for spending time with me today.